Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Jesus said, Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light, and do not come to the light, so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord God. In the name of our loving, liberating, and life-giving God, Amen. Please be seated. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Is there any verse of scripture more familiar in our culture than John 3.16? It may be that for many in our culture it is the only verse that they know or at least the only verse they know the reference for. Interestingly enough, I remember the first time I remember seeing John 3.16 was when I was about 12 years old and I was watching wrestling on TV. Someone in the audience had John 3.16 written in paint on a poster board. I had no idea what it meant back then, but now it appears to be particularly curious considering that it was sketched on a flimsy piece of paper within a crowd that was cheering two grown men attempting to beat the pulp out of one another. <laughs> Over the years, we've seen it displayed at athletic events like the one I mentioned, on bumper stickers or decals, on cars, and emblazoned on all matters of Christian collectibles. In fact, I'm almost certain I see it every time I walk into TJ, into TJ Maxx or a Marshalls in the home decoration area. For that very reason, Many of us find its ubiquity and overuse problematic or even offensive. It's as likely to divide or put people off as it is to attract people to Christianity. For not only does it seem to reduce the truth and beauty of Christianity to a slogan or formula by the overemphasis on belief, it also seems to divide the world between believers and unbelievers, the saved and unsaved. And so, those of us who struggle with doubt and uncertainty, wonder whether we are included among those who will inherit eternal life. One problem with all of this is that, is that by extracting this single verse from its literary context in John's Gospel, it begins to float in the air of our culture, and we attach meanings to individual words, or the whole sentence, that may have little to do with what it means in the larger context of John's Gospel. Its language and themes are part of the larger tapestry of meaning, that John is weaving as he attempts to explain who Jesus is and what it means to follow him. Most importantly, we need to pay attention to the larger context of this verse. Our Gospel reading comes from the third chapter of John, which begins with the encounter of Nicodemus and Jesus. Nicodemus is identified as a Pharisee, a leader of the religious establishment. Significantly, he comes to Jesus by night, and it's clear from his questions that he regards Jesus sympathetically. Even as one whose teaching has authority, he addresses Jesus as rabbi. In their conversation, and this is typical for Jesus' encounters with followers, or would-be followers in John, Jesus makes statements that are ambiguous or open to multiple interpretations. Jesus' puzzling, ambiguous language continues in our Gospel passage. There's that phrase, lifted up. While the connection between the number story and Jesus' crucifixion may be obvious, 
and John's gospel lifted up means more than crucifixion. A better translation here might be exalted, for it better conveys what Jesus and John are getting at. And this gospel crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension are all part of a single action or event. It's a paradox. Certainly the crucifixion is Jesus at his most human and vulnerable, but it is also the moment when his divine nature is most evident. It is the moment of his glorification. It's worth pointing out one other element in John's analogy between the serpent and Jesus being lifted up. We may see in the use and abuse of John 3.16 condemnation and punishment. Unless you believe, you will perish. You will not experience eternal life. For how many people does the cross symbolize that? Condemnation and punishment. But in Numbers, looking at the serpent lifted up in the wilderness brought healing, only healing, rescue and deliverance from sin. So to the cross, on it we see God's love. Looking at Christ lifted up, we receive love, forgiveness and healing. Another word that causes us difficulty as we attempt to approach this passage is the verb believe. It's a word that appears more, more often in John than anywhere else in the New Testament. But it's worth noting that the word faith never appears in John's Gospel. It's an action word, an action verb. So we should think of it not simply as an intellectual assent to certain propositions, but rather think of it dynamically. The later reference to coming to the light suggests dynamics involved. So too does another favorite John word, love. Believing in John is about relationship, about abiding with, being with Jesus, loving Jesus, and being loved by Jesus. One way of thinking about this verse and this whole passage is to be translated a bit to, this is how God loves the world. In the later verses of this passage, there is condemnation and judgment. But above all, there is love, God's love. The passage confronts us with the question of our conception of God, our understanding of the fundamental nature of God, and our own nature and inclinations. inclinations. Is God a God of love or a God of judgment? We might be inclined to see that these two attributes as equal. Certainly both are important and are both intrinsic to God's character. But in this passage, love wins. It's, it's interesting that Nicodemus came to Jesus by night in the darkness. We don't exactly know when he leaves the scene after his last recorded response to Jesus' words, his expression of disbelief and, mis and misunderstanding, or did he stick around until this point when Jesus speaks about those who love darkness better than the light. If so, it's pretty powerful to imagine him hearing those words, turning away and walking back into the night, back into the darkness. That's not the end of Nicodemus' story. We encounter him again at the end of the Gospel, at the end of Jesus' life. John reports that he assisted with Jesus' burial, supplying a hundred pounds of a mixture of myrrh and aloes. Having earlier turned back into the darkness, now having seen Jesus lifted up, Nicodemus walked into the light. We experience sin and brokenness in ourselves and in the world around us. Even during this pandemic, we are being exposed to different levels of brokenness around us that are only just beginning to show their ramifications. I read in The Atlantic the following quote that stirred something in my mind and my heart. We're all walking around with some mild cognitive impairment, said Dr. Mike Yasa, a neuroscientist at UC Irvine. Based on everything we know about the brain, two of the things that are really good for it are physical activity and novelty. A thing that's very bad for it is chronic and perpetual stress. Living through a pandemic, even for those who are doing, it, doing so in relative comfort, is exposing people to microdoses of unpredictable stress all the time, said Franklin, whose research has shown that stress changes the brain regions that control executive function, learning, and memory. Sometimes the baggage of this pandemic is that it burdens us so much that we can see nothing else or know nothing else. We see and experience the sin and brokenness in other ways too. We see it in the racism and homophobia that continue to plague our society, in the marginalization of the poor, in our treatment of immigrants. We see it in all the ways that humans are prevented from flourishing 
from reaching their goals and living into their full potential. We see it in so many ways around us and in our hearts too, in our broken relationships, our addictions, and self-destructive behavior. But God loves the world. God loves us. God offers us, in relationship with Jesus Christ, a different way and a different possibility for living. Sometimes that is hard to know and to experience, especially given the current situation of the world. But, my beloved family, I say to you, look up to the cross, look to Christ lifted up, and see God's love, not God's punishment. See and experience healing and hope. See the possibility and promise of new life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Amen.